Hi guys, and they have let me out of my video studio for one afternoon only. And here I am in the London store. And the task today is to find a bright alto setup. That includes a saxophone and a mouthpiece ligature and reed. And I thought it would be useful for you if I was to pick out two setups, a much more affordable student option, and if money were no object, a really expensive option. So here I am presented with all the alto saxophones, professional ones and student ones around the corner. I'm going to sort of walk down the aisles and see what I can discover. So we have right in front of me here, immediately I'm seeing Yanagizawa solid silver saxophones. Very good for a bright sound, actually, as solid silver finishes. So that could be a contender for the very expensive option. But I'm just going to flick down the options and see what really grabs me in terms of a professional alto option. So as so we go down here, we've got more Yanagizawas, so good for, in general, for that sort of bright sound. Um, but I'm looking perhaps for something a little bit different. So we've got Yamahas here, a similar kind of sphere to the Yanagizawas, can deliver quite a sort of poppy contemporary sound, particularly the custom Zs that we've got up here. Um, let's move further down. Silver plated finishes in general, that can add a certain sweetness and sort of zing to the sound, if you like. So that can easily work. We're moving through to some slightly darker options in sound here. So we've got Ramponis, uh, Selma reference saxes, um, for a, a little bit more of a sort of meaty, vintagey sound perhaps. So we're going to ignore these for the particular purpose of finding a bright setup. And as we go down, we've got more Selmas here, signature customs, lovely sort of warm sounds, so not quite the kind of thing that I'm looking for in terms of a bright, pokey sound. Let's just move around the corner and see what we have presented with here. Right, so we're actually into the student instruments here, and I'm just being attracted to this instrument here, which is a Trevor James Horn 88. Now, this is more of a sort of upper-level student instrument, um, but in terms of the affordability, well, there's a check on that one for a start, but in terms of its brightness of tone, I've always thought this to be a, a great contender. It's a little bit like a classic, but a dressed up classic. So classics have a, a certain warmth of sound to them. This has that same tonal kind of quality, but with a bit extra sort of presence in the tone. And I think uh, it's this finish here that really does add to, to that uh, sort of general tonality. So in terms of a budget option, just uh, sneaking in under a thousand pounds, the Horn 88 could be a great starting point. So I'm going to take this into the studio and give it a test run. But in a minute, I'm going to find some uh, mouthpiece and reed setups to, uh, to complement this saxophone. So let's put that back for the time being and carry on down the aisle. So more student options here. So we've already got our student instrument. So I'm just now looking for that killer professional sax. And I have a sneaking suspicion that, aha, this is what I'm looking for. We have a cannonball Gerald Albright sax here, perfect for that bright sound. I don't know if you know about the player Gerald Albright, but look him up. He's an amazing smooth jazz American artist who produces an absolutely powerful, radical, bright, modern sound. Um, it really is uh, something to behold. Um, up here, we've also got the Kilworth Shadow, very similar looking saxophones, great looking saxophones. And this also really produces a punch in the sound. So I'm kind of a little bit torn between these two beauties here. Um, but I think, hmm, I don't know really. I think I'm going to go for this one just because it's the most expensive one. But they're along a similar kind of line. So actually the base metal in this one here, this Keelworth, is actually nickel silver. So rather than just having a, a brass um, body, which is the standard for, for most of these saxes we've seen here, the base metal underneath this plating is actually nickel silver, which really adds a lot of punch to the sound, a lot of projection. And then on top of that nickel silver, we've got a black nickel plating, which adds some extra zing to the sound, as well as the silver plated mechanism and keywork that you see there. So that is a great contemporary and expensive alto saxophone. So we just need to pair this up with a mouthpiece now. So let's put that back for the time being. Let's step this way over to the mouthpiece cabinet. past the baritones, the Christmas trees. So, into the alto mouthpieces. Now, 
There's obviously a distinction between hard rubber and metal mouthpieces and it tends to be more the norm to use a hard rubber mouthpiece on an alto setup. Just in that the alto already has a high pitch to it and potentially a kind of slightly more twee sound and often players will try and balance up that natural kind of pitchiness that you get in an alto with a slightly warmer sort of sounding mouthpiece. So it's very common to have a hard rubber mouthpiece of some description mixing in with your alto setup to produce a nice overall balanced sound. But because I'm specifically after this bright setup for the purposes of this video and players looking for that bright sound, I'm going to pick a hard rubber mouthpiece that's bright as well as a metal piece that's bright. So I'm going to pick one of each. So let's go for a, a, a budget a hard rubber option first of all. And as I look along the rows here, yes, this is the one I'm looking for. Quite distinctive because it has this, uh, this white bite patch. This is a Claude Lakey. This, this one at the moment is sneaking in just under 100 pounds. And these are absolutely fantastic for a, a pop setup. So let's just slide that out of the cabinet. Yeah, very distinctive looking mouthpieces. And so the, the main components of this mouthpiece in order to give it that sound are that it's got a, a small chamber, it really compresses into this point here so the sound really channels in and comes out in a very focused manner. But also the really key part of the mouthpiece um, is the baffle and the, particularly the tip of the baffle. This, this is the business end of the mouthpiece and this is what really sort of channels and uh, distinguishes the sound. And it's very high at this point here, just in behind where the reed is doing a lot of its vibrating. So, I mean, it doesn't look like there's much to it. It's really lightweight, uh, but it has a high baffle and it has a small chamber. And I can tell you from experience, this thing really does go. So combine this with a brighter reed, put it on one of these saxes, and uh, you're gonna be uh, just amazed at what a smacking sound you can produce. So, so that is gonna be my budget mouthpiece. Now, just because it's budget at 99 pounds, it doesn't mean there's a lack of quality there. Um, for example, uh, there's quite a few pop players who play on this piece uh, to, to, to do what they need to do in the professional world. Simon Williscroft being one of them, amazing player. He uses one of these, he doesn't need an expensive metal mouthpiece, this does the job very nicely for him. Because there's a certain amount of warmth and underlayer in the sound because of the hard rubber, as well as the sort of natural, sort of bright tendencies that you get, as I've just explained. So that's the Claude Lakey. Just look at some metal options down here. So we're looking at this row here. I mean, immediately on the left here, we've got a Theo One Fire mouthpiece. That's an incredibly bright mouthpiece, as a lot of the Theo One pieces can be. Um, immediately, you can just see that baffle there straight away. And again, it narrows up at this point here, really squeezing the sound. Um, there's a few others here. There's a Durga, very well known for having a big step baffle. Yep, there it is, very nice. Um, and then as we look further along, there's a super jet. That's a slightly more budget option over and above um, some of the more expensive Jody pieces, such as the DV. Um, yeah, very bright, impactful mouthpiece there. Um, and in terms of one to pick for my, my setup in the studio, hmm, I think I'm gonna go for the Jody DV, actually. We've got a, a number eight here. Again, it's got the high baffle. It's got a bit of a unique setup here with this cutaway section here to add extra resonance. Um, beautifully constructed mouthpiece and a real step baffle. I don't know if you can pick that out, but uh, it, it drops off. It comes in about an inch and it drops straight down. Um, so a, an impressively um, poppy commercially sort of sounding mouthpiece there. So that's gonna be my expensive mouthpiece option. And in terms of ligature and reed, well, first of all, in terms of the mouthpiece setup, which is the mouthpiece, the ligature, and the reed, the two absolutely key components in producing um, a, a bright sound, or in fact, uh, just making everything possible um, and having the most influence would be the mouthpiece and the reed. The ligature is important, um, but it's a little bit more functional rather than having a direct effect on the sound. Uh, nonetheless, um, it's still important to get the right ligature, um, and I'm presented with a bunch of Rovners here. And I think the Versa, this always used to be a favorite of mine when I used to play a Guadala metal uh, tenor mouthpiece. The Versa strikes a nice balance in that it has, has this metal plate here, 
which comes into contact with the reed and just um, makes everything ring through a little bit more as well as having the sort of uh, security of the you know the leather section here so I'm going to use a leather uh, uh, sorry a versa ligature pair that up with the mouthpieces that I've chosen there and I'm going to do a demonstration on the Horn 88 with those two mouthpiece setups and then I'm going to contrast that with the um, the shadow saxophone that you saw me select with those two mouthpieces and generally speaking you're just going to hear bright all round but you will hear some kind of subtle tonal differences and I'm going to discuss that a little bit further in the studio. <laughs> Okay, so I have the Horn 88 here, as mentioned in part one of the video, with the Claude Lakey mouthpiece. So actually, in terms of the four setups that I'm going to present to you today, this is the most budget of the setups. Um, this is basically a sort of high-level student instrument with this nice frosted um, kind of silvery finish, which gives it an extra bit of a fizz in the sound, as I was mentioning before and this rather bright but lovely Claude Lakey mouthpiece. So this is setup one. Without too much more talking, I'm gonna go straight into setup two, which is the Jody DV mouthpiece. <laughs> Well, this is a great mouthpiece, uh, the Jody DV, very fat at the bottom, and we're doing this video to try and demonstrate bright setups, and it certainly is a bright setup overall, but there's a lot of fatness in the bass part of the sound there that you can hear, but it really powers through. So just talking about a little comparison between the, this mouthpiece, the DV, and the Claude Lakey, both very good. Um, I just find that there's a little bit of an edge with this one in terms of that weight of sound, the sort of width within the sound, particularly in those sort of lower regions of the sax. And then at the top, it's just got a little bit more spike and attack. Um, there's a bit more of a, a slight element of roundness with the Claude Lakey, um, more that ebonite thing, I suppose, but there's just a bit more spike with this one, but then it goes fat at the same time in the sort of lower region. So it's very interesting, and it stacks up very well on this, um, basically, an advanced student instrument. I mean, you wouldn't know it's a student instrument from the kind, of, um, the kind of powerhouse of sound that you can get from this whole setup, which I suppose is partially um, the point of this kind of demonstration in this video, but it will be interesting to see what happens now when I move to the Kilworth Shadow Sax.
Very nice. Now let's move on to the DV. Okay, so another nice mouthpiece on what I think is a superb saxophone. Well, just to talk about this shadow saxophone for a minute, I really feel that it's kind of elevated my playing, just moving on to this instrument um, with both mouthpieces. So I really enjoyed my playing with the Claude Lakey on this uh, Kilworth Shadow. Um, more, I have to be honest, than on the um, Horn 88. I mean, it did a fine job, but there was something in the sound of this uh, kill of shadow that just elevated everything. So just firstly um, on the Claude Lakey, it's a lovely creamy kind of rich sound and there's a lot of warmth in there even though this is a video about a bright sounding setup. So it's, it's lovely when you can find a mouthpiece that kind of melds different styles so you, you feel that you've got that kind of, you can fall back onto that um, kind of darker, creamier and smooth kind of sound. And, very powerful sound that I was getting with the Claude Lakey. And then when you push it, it doesn't go edgy, but it retains this nice kind of core to the sound, but it had this lovely brightness to it, really rich brightness that was really elevated by the qualities um, of this saxophone, it really pushed it out. Um, so I really enjoyed my time there on the Claude Lakey. It's a great setup there, the Claude Lakey Ebonite with this shadow. And then moving on to this, um, kind of a similar feeling, um, uh, just a really nice playing experience overall. And again, like I commented before, you get those nice kind of husky undertones with this mouthpiece when you're playing in the lower regions and then it's very powerful at the top. But at the same time, you still get that extra quality oozing through um, courtesy of this, this really wonderful shadow actually. So I'm really favoring both setups there. This, this DV is work, working beautifully, as well as the Claude Lakey and I'm sure many other mouthpieces as well. So it's an interesting exam to sort of see how you know a student instrument stacks up against this one. I don't know how it's going to come across to you at home when you're viewing this, but certainly in the room here we just feel that everything has come alive um, with this instrument. So I hope that comes across to you. Uh, but yeah, it's been a very interesting test. I've not done this kind of, um, kind of examination before where we've scientifically taken two setups on a student instrument and moved them to a pro instrument. But for me, like, for me I really feel a big difference moving from this instrument to this instrument. So I look forward to your comments on this video and see you on the next one.